And I remember being like, oh no, like it's not, this is this was my only shot. Right. And then the three of us, so Marco, a physio from the center and Victor Troiki were sort of teasing me. We're like, oh, too bad, Judy, too bad, you're not <laughs> playing with him. And then they said, hold on, let us have a reunion, a meeting to decide whether or not we can change that. So the three of them, oh Novak God. was sat on his chair. Just playing so with your heart. <laughs> they were completely playing. And then they turned around and they were like, no, no. You know, in French, the no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember looking at Novak being like, I was like, in my head, I was like, you're not going to do that, like, are I've you? I've got the tennis shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, look, <laughs> I brought the shoes. Welcome to another edition of the Board with Nelly podcast. Today I'm joined by Julie. She is a t teacher, I believe, English teacher. I am a yeah. French teacher. French teacher. Okay, cool. And a big Nola fan. Um, there's a lot of things I want to talk to you about. You're not a typical guest for me because that's how I can't really research you too much. I can't really go in depth. <laughs> so I got to go into this dry, not knowing anything about you, and, and ask you okay. a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, well, my name is Julie. I'm 32. Uh, I'm originally French, but I also have the British nationality now. And my I'm based in London, um, but my whole family lives in France. And I've been a Novak fan since 2006, um, when I discovered him on French TV uh, during the French Open. And yeah, I think that's that's what you need to know for now. I'm sure <laughs> we'll come out to more details later. <laughs> Okay, before the, the Nola love, let's talk about a little bit about yourself. You know, what do you do? Um, a little bit more about your life, I guess. Well, I'm a teacher in London. Um, it's been 12 years now. I've been in the UK. Um, teaching has always been my thing. I've been doing loads of tutoring since I've been a teenager. And um, for my hobbies, well, I would say tennis and music are my two things. Listening to music and going to concerts. Um, that was the first thing actually where I spent my money on to. Um, when I started having jobs, I went to concerts for oh. my favorite band in the UK. And that's how I think I also fell in love with, in the, with the UK. Sorry, because as I said, I'm originally from France. And that's, I think that's what made me move there as well. And um, yeah, tennis, tennis, I had a love of tennis since I was a little girl um, because of the French Open. Because in France, you know, when it's the French Open, you see it everywhere on TV. And um, then for personal reasons, I sort of stepped away from tennis when I was like 11. And then discovering Novak actually made me come back to tennis. And um, it is my favorite sport. And, you know. Reunite um, your love for tennis. Absolutely. And I think that's also why, you know, I love Novak so much is because that my support to him brought me back that love right. of my favorite sport. And I think it's just much more than just liking Novak as a player. It's just also very personal sure. and very, you know, about me, you know. Sure. What, where does the love for teaching come from? What's that about? Is that a tough question? Is that a tough question? Has no one asked you this? No, I've never really. Um, oops, sorry. My phone You're is good. falling. You're good. <laughs> um, I, uh, well, my mom has always wanted to be a teacher, but she never became one. And I don't know if that is that has a link. I don't know. I just I found it very rewarding, you know, because and I like I like having a relationship with people, etc. How it started, I don't know. It was just natural to me since a very young age. I've said I I'll be a teacher. Before that, I wanted to be a singer. You okay. know, when you're a little girl, sure. you're like oh, I I sing. You yes. know, and I, and I do love singing, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just it's just. It's literally a vocation. Is that vocational? Is that how you say it in English? I think it is. It's just something very natural to natural. me. Teaching is my thing. Yeah. You know? So, so I, I describe this podcast as a career podcast, but in reality, it's just me inviting people I want to talk to. Um, sometimes that's mm -hmm. the hook to bring them on. So I'm always curious, where does that love for something stem from? If it can be rooted somewhere deeper. Mm. It's tough. It's a tough question well, I sometimes. Had, I had... Um, a teacher when I was a very young one who was amazing. He was a diamond, really. And I think, I don't know, he, 
I, f- I feel like he, how could I say this? He gave me roots for life. Mm-hmm. And I feel like my respect and admiration and love for him also made me want to become like him. Sure. Um, because he, he's, he's passed away, unfortunately, very young. And, and I think, yeah, it's a way as well. I think, yeah, there are lots of different reasons, but I, don't, I think like when I was, I started tutoring at 14. Wow, um, really? And I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, in my own school, I was starting giving like French lessons to kids in primary school. Um, yeah, it's just been my thing. Um, I just, I just love doing it, you know? And how it's, did you, it's demanding, I, but I imagine, it's rewarding. I, I, how did you learn English then? That... Well, in school, in but school, yeah. but my love for my for a favorite band that I have, that is a British band. Um, I remember like literally going on the internet, starting going on the internet um, in 2005, I was 15, and just finding any possible interview. So we didn't have the internet at home in 2003, four, and I remember discovering 2003 and going to a place in my town during my free time, during the holidays and right. finding any possible interview, printing them. And then I had little books where I was trying to translate them. I had my massive dictionary at home. <laughs> That's passion, and I was trying yeah. to translate. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I wanted to learn English because I've told myself from quite a young age, as soon as I discovered that, Ben, I said, one day I'll go and, and, and I'll meet them and I'll go and see them in concert and I will meet them in person. I will tell them thank right. you for, you know, and, and I did. When oh, I was, really? Um, 20. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What and, band is um, do, you, do you mind me asking? What... It, no, no, it's called McFly. It's a British McFly. band. So they're not very McFly. known worldwide. Marty McFly, like the Back to the Future? They took the name from Back to the Future, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clever. But um, they're not worldwide known, but in the UK they had seven number ones. Right. So, um, but years ago, I have to say now, they may be a little bit less popular, but they still have quite a core cool fan base of all people my age, you know, from quite around the world, actually. Right. Um, so, yeah, I used to translate the the interviews and I used to I remember I had my little notebook as well you know where I had separated in two columns the French and English you know I was writing every right. single new word I had cut out so that I could do the A B C D E F G you know by alphabetical order like right. I was quite yeah um stationary wise it was interesting <laughs> that's dedication because nowadays the, the kids nowadays the kids have everything like they have a billion I agree. apps they have you yeah know, tutors they yeah have... yeah so many it was it was literally what i was doing in my free time i've never been much more of a party girl when i was younger i was not social either like i didn't like talking to strangers i i found any social situation very awkward i was very shy like i was shy like now that would be like (laughs) people would laugh when i would say that but um yeah it was my thing in my free time in the summer before i was able to have a, a small job i was doing that in my free time like you know the interviews and um yeah in june in june it was watching the french open though right you know as soon as you come back from school it was putting the tv on and just watching the clay <laughs> that's cool i i remember when i was a kid I, I thought i would never need english when i was seven or six my mm. mom tried to get me into english classes i'm like what why the hell would i need this like i'm not gonna mm. and then we moved to canada like a year later i'm like ugh, I probably should have paid a little more yeah in those english classes <laughs> yeah, it was for me language is I find them fascinating yes. and like my brain loves to understand the why it works this way. And, and I'm a linguist, you know, that's just Me once too. again, one it. of my things. There's something that keeps your brain. I'm trying to learn. I've been learning Spanish for over two years now. So I, there's a, there's like a hidden dopamine rush when I get learned something new in a mm. language that I can't really get from other things. I don't know if you're the same. Well, one of the best thing like to challenge a brain at any age, okay. Right. Is to, to learn languages. Like, look, I would, I've told myself the day I have kids, you know, when they're two, three, I'm, I'm going to, because they're sponges, you know, that's the of best course. age to yeah. literally teach them any language. And then to have, I want to have bilingual kids, you know, for sure, because it's fascinating to see how you just switch languages like that. Yeah, there's also like a lot of, I think there was a lot of studies about like the benefits of knowing multiple languages. And, and oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So, you know early childhood stuff what were you kind of like as a kid what did you enjoy doing besides tennis and, and stuff like that oh dear i'm listening to music oh sorry my <laughs> i'm gonna make a compilation of all the I'm times gonna, i'm gonna hold it i'm gonna hold it <laughs> it's all um, good 
Uh, yeah, in the bloopers. You're gonna in be the like, blooper reel, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what did I like doing? Oh, um, I don't know. I was a very introvert kid. Like, I was not into many things. I was just into listening music, singing. I used to sing quite loud when I was a kid. Traveling? Um, no. Me neither. No. I hated traveling when I was a kid, but now I like that's all I want to do. Yeah, but you know, when you're a kid, it doesn't depend on you, does it? You know. No, and, it doesn't. Um, yeah, it's on your parents, right? Yeah, I did go to a few places in France, but um, didn't really go abroad when I was a kid. Just the borders, but that's it. And um, yeah, I was. I, I can't say I was boring as a kid, but because you know we all have different sure. things, and and introvert people are not boring, but. I, I can't really recall a part what I was doing. I don't know. I I was writing. I still love writing a lot, making up my own sto- stories, my own scenarios. I remember I had written a story of witches, like when I was nine, ten years old, because I was inspired by I don't know if you know the series Charmed. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. And yeah, and I was I was very much into like having powers, you know. Interesting. Um, yeah, writing was also my thing. I. I did well actually yes writing was my thing I used to write some poems when I was for like because of that very inspirational teacher right um which I still have somewhere in a box somewhere here <laughs> right. uh, but yeah writing was my thing I already liked taking photos because I remember begging my mum to have you know the disposable ones because back then it was right. what was the most affordable um yeah very artsy and things. Other... looking at it it's very artsy things you know I hated drawing though. Oh, like I remember my teacher. <laughs> That's when you draw having, the hard line. <laughs> yeah, I remember my teacher having to literally, and it was I remember being in my report, being like, "I'm struggling to get Judy to draw," like she refuses to. Right. I was I was already rebellious. Right. <laughs> Stubborn. Here's what I was Stubborn. when I was a kid. That's Stubborn. what I was too. Yes. So my name is uh, Nenad, and in Serbian, mm-hmm. ne means no. Yeah. And for the first, like, 10 years of my life, like, anything that my parents would ask me, it would always be, nah, nah. Like, nah. <laughs> do you want to go to Greece? Nah. Do you want to, like, do something? Nah. Like, it would be, do you want to eat? No. Like, it would always, mm. and that, that nickname was hung until, like, my early teens, and then eventually, Anelli, kind of, in Canada, I became ca- Canadianized, and then. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair so, enough. where does the, okay, let's, you said 2006 is the love for Nola. Yeah. And you saw him on TV, French Open. Was he? Was yeah. He, I'm trying to think how old he was. He was a teenager, right? He was 19. He was 19. Wow. Yeah. He had just a 19. And actually, you know, sometimes how in life you've got very vivid memories. Yeah. And um, I have this very vivid memory. Like, literally, I could describe to you the living room of my mom's house back then. And, and... Like, I remember my mom had loads of plants next to the TV and, you know, where the TV was. Right. But um, I remember that because, um, if I'm not mistaken, Nadal won the French Open in 2005. And there was Probably. Obviously He's won every one of the, yeah. <laughs> the last 20 years. I, I mean, for the first time. For the first time, and, yes. Um, yes. I think so. And there was a lot of hype um, around him. And I remember, you know, and actually it was the summer because I was one year early in my studies. So I was um, revising for... Um, the French exam, because in France, you take the French exam at 17 years old, okay. but I was one year early in my studies, so I was 16. Gotcha. And um, I remember the commentators. I, I, the first thing I remember is turning my head and seeing this guy with a French jersey, wearing ah, a yes, French jersey. Yes, that famous interview where he talks about Nadal. That's the one. Yes. That's the one. And me, I was not very following the hype i never had a a favorite player before that i liked guga because of his hair and it reminded me of me you know and my curly hair i didn't have a lot of people around me with curly hair i'm I'm the only one in my family even you know my parents don't have curly hair my siblings don't have curly hair anyway and you know i remember just rooting for mostly usually the french guy when i was watching a match but nothing as you know like passion you know and uh, i remember for nadal not really following the hype i had nothing against him and but i was just not like Meh. right and um i remember the commentators making fun of novak about this comment where you know if i missed put things in context when novak was saying um so novak had we withdrawn against him after being two sets down mm-hmm. okay so novak was really losing that match and then right. he retired 
And um, Novak said, um, he's not unbeatable about Nadal. He said, today I saw, you know, basically like holes in his game and he's not unbeatable. And I remember the commentators making fun of him, being like, well, that's presumptuous because, you know, you withdrew, um, right. like, you know, being two sets down. And I remember being like, hmm, I like this. I like the ambition. <laughs> yes. You know, I was like, yeah, oh, I like... He's mixing it up. Borderline, borderline arrogance. Yes. But I liked it. Right. You know, I was just like, ooh. And then I remember going to the computer and typing this name, you know, Novak Djokovic, and starting having a look. And that's how it started. You know. Did, did, did he already was he was he already doing those impression videos, impersonations, or is that? Yeah. How, yeah is that what? Yeah. It's, it's well, I mean, it got bigger a little bit um, yeah. afterwards Sharapova, when you yeah, 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 all of that. Yeah, I did like it back then, but like if you were to do it now, I'd be like, mm, I think. Yeah, you know. yeah, I feel like when he was younger, he was probably just looking for something to kind of distinguish himself, or you know, kind of to fit in. And he he's always seen as this mm. kind of funny guy. No, I'm not sure if he wanted to distinguish himself. I think Novak is just a funny guy overall. He is, yeah. yeah. But he was like over the top. Like, well, not over the, for his. He was young. He was at his age. He was like. He was like a performer. Exactly. Like more now, now he's more relaxed yeah. and much more, you know, it's a little yeah. different. And I think came a point where he was like, okay, that's enough. Like I want the results now. That's all I want. Right. And that's when he was, I, well, he's also said that apparently some people used to be offended by it. So yeah, there was a lot of that drama I yeah. remember in the early days. I don't know. People couldn't take a joke then. Um, so the other thing I wanted to ask you was then when, when was the first game you went to see him live? after that 2006. 2016 wow it took 10 years because yeah simply for a question of money didn't have right. the money to go before um because i was going mostly for concerts and for my favorite bands because um they appeared before novak so they sort of have the priority sure and uh when i went to the uk for the first years i i just didn't have money at all like you know um when i did my degree to become a teacher that was a very tough year financially and then after that, when I started working, you know, it was my rent, my bills and going back home. That's what I had money for. And in 2016, I was just like, OK, I need to finally go and watch him. And so I went to the uh, ATP Masters in London because it was still in London. And, you know, as you know, I've been living in London for the last 10 years. Right. And um, I had no idea, absolutely no idea how schedule worked, how, you know, like I was I never, I never thought about it because I never had to look into it. So um, I just took one evening where I found a pretty decent seat at a pretty decent price, and uh, turns out that Novak was playing that evening. Really? It was a Tuesday. It was a Tuesday evening against Milos Raonic. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah you will know him. <laughs> I do know Milos Raonic. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, I just, and it's still up to now because you know I'm super lucky. But when Novak enters the court. I have these sort of butterflies in my stomach and where I could cry of happiness. Like the emotions completely overwhelm me when he enters the court. It's just, and I remember that evening behind me, I had a couple, a British couple, and I think they could feel my excitement. And they were, you know, they were like, oh, you like him? I said, he's my favorite player. Like I've been waiting for so long to see him. So then they tried to take a photo with me. So at the end of the changeover, when Novak came on our side of the court, because I was on the, on the right of the umpire. Right. Um, I remember he was like, oh, try try and, you know, turn around so that, because they were behind me, try and turn around so that I can take a photo with you. Of course, the photo was going to be rubbish. Sure. But um, I remember he took a photo, but um, Novak bent down to do his shoelace. So my first photo of Novak is literally my face taking most of the picture. Yeah. And then behind, in the back, you've got Novak bending. So you see his bum. <laughs> so that's the first picture I ever have. Like I said the other day to someone that I should take it out. Like I should post that picture and just to show it to people. And it's in one of my external hard drive. I need to go and find it. That's so funny. You know, it's, that is quite funny. <laughs> and, then, and then I remember buying... Um, I, I think the addiction started of going right. to tennis matches. Like I saw him and I was just like, we're not stopping there. So then I bought, I bought another ticket on Via Gogo for the semifinal. And semifinal, I was row B. Like I, I established where was the place to be. So it was, you know, on the left-hand side of the umpire because that's where he left. Sure. And, you know, trying to text the closest. And um, I brought a Serbian flag um, that I bought on site. And... Um, yeah, I was like, that's it. We need to represent, you know. Right. 
and that's when it started yeah did he did he does he remember that was he like did he see you that day no no of course not. no 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 20, 2016 I, wow i'm gonna be honest i was a bit scared of meeting novak um because novak has so much charisma Sure. And if you take the Novak just on court, without watching the interviews, without watching everything else, without social media, Novak can be, and I'm going to put this in between brackets, but a little bit scary, you know, because he gets, he can get very angry at himself, at his box, you yes. know, and I, I don't mind that at all. It's a lot of passion. And actually, that's also why I love him so much. But it, you know, for me back then, I was a little bit like, you know, oof, I, right. you know never meet your idols that's what they say right, right? right. <laughs> so i was like mm. and actually i i uh, at the end of that week i met him for the first time and he did something that made me change my mind completely as in being scared i was just like okay right. i'm not scared of this guy he's he's amazing and from now on i'm gonna you know like sort of dedicate myself to him and that's also a time when my favorite band was so often a hiatus so all that money that I usually spend at the concerts, <laughs> Why write the no, no I games? Could, <laughs> that's cool. It, it did. It really did. And right. and that's when I think my attention um, shifted in a way, you right. know, went from one to the other. The other, the band is still my favorite band. And, you know, I went to see them in concert, I don't know, last May, I think. And then I'm going to see them in September again. Right. But once again, here now I'm 32. I'm not 24 anymore. And, sure. you know, the money is not the same. So um, they're still, you know, because... And I, I want to insist on that because I receive so many messages and sometimes so many digs at how are you doing this, like financially? And people think I'm a millionaire or that Novak pays everything for me. Like right. someone said to me a few days ago, Novak's paying for your flight. I was like, what? No, he's not. <laughs> um, but it's just a lot of saving money, calculations. Um, yeah, it's a lot of that. But yeah, I did meet him for the first time in November 2016. Actually, the evening he lost against Murray. So I saw him play for the semi-final. And then the final, I didn't go. I just watched the match at home. And uh, then I met him. And yeah, what, what was that, that like? Yeah, what was meeting Novak like? Well, first of all, I was not, as I told you, I was scared. And I met him at his hotel. That's the first time and only time ever that I've met Novak in a sort of private space because for me usually hotels are a boundary where sure. i wouldn't go but i had no idea how to meet this guy like vo2 is massive um clearly and I, I you know i had gone around wimbledon even though i had not been able to go inside the premises i was like there's no way to meet him you sure. know so um when you go well back then now it's a bit different but in 2016 when you went on the tag you could see loads of posts and three different people had posted photos with Novak and two of them in the lobby of the hotel and one of them in the park next to the hotel. So I was like, okay, that must be the hotel. So I went there. It was, I arrived at 9 p.m., okay? Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, okay, surely he's going to come by car. And I remember, like... You're setting was... a really good scene, by the way. This is good. I found him on Instagram. <laughs> the tags because... were there. I came at 9 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, because because it's so vivid for me. You know, it's just right. it's the first time I met him. I wouldn't be able to give you that much details of timings for all the right. times I met him. But that first time was so... Because, because also, um, I was telling everything to my friend. And my friend played a huge part in me not leaving. Because we, I had said to myself one hour. Like it was raining as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a very chic um, area. So I was staying absolutely not in front of the hotel entrance, but I would say 50 meters down. And I was under like it was a, a jewelry store, very, you know, luxury jewelry store. And they had a little soft thing that was covering the window. So I was putting myself under it so that I was not under the rain. Sure. But there were cars and I timed it. I remember timing it. There were cars arriving every 30 seconds, black cars arriving every 30 seconds. So it's dark, it's raining, black cars arriving every 30 <laughs> seconds. Right. And then I remember being like, okay, maybe he's going to take another entrance. You know, he's so big. Like, you know, for me, Novak is like God, you know. So I'm like, mm. And then I was like, oh, he's lost against Murray. Maybe I'm going to bother him. Maybe he doesn't want to stop. Right. Maybe, yeah. you know, I, I him on a came bad move or nothing. something, right? Yeah. Exactly. You know, and, and he's just lost. It's Sunday evening, you know. And, um, I remember at 10 saying to my friend, okay, I think he's, he's gone another way. Cause you know, I had calculated with, looked on Google, how long <laughs> it takes from the O2 to that hotel. This could have been know? a very different Netflix documentary. Interview, <laughs> like. 
Well, it's funny because my friends said to me, my colleagues actually also said to me that Netflix should do a documentary of me being a fan. You yeah, know? that'd be funny. I'd watch that. <laughs> we start with and, this story, uh, though. The 10 o'clock, <laughs> dark, yeah. you're, you're fighting him on Instagram, yeah. black cars. And my, my friend said, stay five more minutes. She was right. like, come on, don't give up. Because that friend, I met her through the other band where we waited for them in places as well, sometimes for a long time. And she was like, rule number one, don't leave your spot. So I didn't leave my spot. And then literally like an angel amongst all the black cars in the darkness, there's a white car that arrives. <laughs> and I spot Yelena. Oh, nice. And then literally, I don't know how to explain, my body just went, oh, that it is in that car. You know, I was like, he's here. So he was in there. Right. And um, there was also, what's his name? There was the president of the ATP back then. I forgot his name suddenly. Um, the ex-president now, because now it's a different one. Right. But um, who was in there. And there was the chauffeur. They opened the, the boot. And I remember being like, okay, what do I do? So I started getting closer. And I said, hey, Novak, but quiet like this. You know, even though it was not just close right. to didn't react. And then he was walking in. Yelena had already walked in. And of course, I was not going into the lobby, like right. too much for me. And uh, I said, hi, Novak, like louder. And he turned towards me and he was like, yeah. And in my head, I went, oh, I'm annoying him. Like, I was like, I'm annoying him. That's it. Oh, I'm no. ruined it before, you know, even like, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the end. Right. And then when I, when I'm nervous, I can talk a lot and quite fast. So I went, hi Novak, I'm really sorry you lost tonight, but for me, you're my favorite one. It's been 10 years I've been supporting you. Now for me, you're the best. I love you so much. And he laughed. Right. <laughs> he laughed. And then he did something, you know, I told you earlier on that was me, yeah. for me, was the sign I've chosen the right one. He took off his cap and he shook my hand. He, so he took off his cap to shake my hand. And in France, it's a huge sign of respect when you do that. Right. So I went, okay. <laughs> I was like, hi. <laughs> you know, like, okay. And in my head, I was just like, oh, okay, I'm not annoying him. We're good. We're good. We're good. <laughs> so we took a photo. And in my foot, like in the photo, like, I think literally you can see the stars and the hearts in my eyes. Is it and on your Instagram? Uh, Is it like on the very bottom or something? Is it like the very I don't beginning? think I posted oh, the no? first photo ever. Oh, no. Okay. Right. I don't think I've posted it. Um, I, I could send it to you after. Yeah, I it's see in my it. phone. Please. It's in my phone. But um, yeah, it's the, yeah. That's so <laughs> Like, funny. even talking about it, I'm just like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> you look <laughs> like back at it. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, it was it was awesome. But he is awesome. Like, really, he's the best one. Wow, that's, that's great. And, so, yeah. and I think that first meeting was like, okay, this guy deserves my support. Right. And, and I'm going to. I'm going to step up. But what really made me step up is the fact he got injured in 2017. Because in 2017, yes. I wanted to go in and see him more. And in 2017, I booked to go to New York for the first time. So it was the first time I was getting out of Europe traveling solo. I had traveled solo in Europe, uh, but not outside Europe. Right. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to go to New York for the first time, mostly being a tourist. And I'll go to the US Open for the first two days. Because, of course, for me, I need to be in work um, at work the 1st of September. Sure. And as we all know, Novak um, retired at Wimbledon and then decided decided not to play for the next six uh, months. Right. And I remember just being heartbroken, just being like, oh my gosh, if there's no Novak, like, you know, what's going on? And then I discovered, I still went, of course, but I discovered practice week where in the US Open, they open for free the week before, usually. And um, I was like, next year, like, I have to come back for when Novak, you know, will be there. And because I was really ready second half of 2017 to already go more, you right, know. Right. Um, I did watch him play in Roland Garros 2017, of course, because um, Roland Garros is always easier for me because it's closer. Sure. Also and Wimbledon... cheap, cheap compared to the other ones, I think. It's a lot cheaper from what I've checked, no? Uh, similar to Wimbledon, I would say, to see Novak play on big courts. Yes. Uh, US Open is always so expensive. And Australian Open, I haven't gone yet. Okay. So I, I don't know about prices. Yeah. But um, yeah, and, and I was ready in 2017 to start this. But then the fact he was out 2018 was the one I was like, now we're literally saving every penny that we can. And we're doing this. So 2018, I started. 2019 was the year I went to nine tournaments in Whoa. a year. Um, <laughs> when he starts seeing you at every tournament, <laughs> he's like, oh, okay, I, this is a le like a legit hardcore fantasy. I've seen... Oh, no, 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 no. I won him before. I won him. Oh, Literally, <laughs> Queens 2018, um, 
I've, we had met a couple of times, but I don't think he was putting a face to a name yet. Right, you know, like, right. And in 2018, when he played at Queen's last minute, and Queen's, of course, is in London, there was a free practicing weekend. And uh, I went in and I found out where was the place to wait for him after practice. And I gave him a card because I had written a card for him to basically tell him how much I admired him. And I said to him, right, Novak, I, let, I said, can you remember my face and my hair? Because I said, now you're going to see me everywhere. Like, I'm going to go out of my way to support you and he's in ter- person. He's terrified. He's like, oh, my God. Oh, no. No, don't say that. Because then, kidding, then you're kidding. making me I'm look kidding. like a groupie. Please don't say that. You I'm have kidding. no idea how many times I've heard that. Just kidding. And that's not his case at all. No, of course And not. then, then actually, two months later in New yeah. York, um, he did a Labour Cup press conference in 2018. Right. And my friend texted me. I was I was on my way to the US Open. And I had, luckily, like, you know, sometimes the stars are aligned. I got the Wi-Fi in a tube station. And she told me. So I went back because he was actually just next to my hotel in the morning. And I had no idea. He was doing the two-day show. So I was gutted to miss that. And then she told me about the Labour Cup press conference. And I remember, once again, like the stars, you know, like I arrived at the address she gave me and it was just massive buildings everywhere. Like literally, I had no idea. It was just doors everywhere, etc. And then I saw something reflect in the sun and there was a guy, you know, with the A3 pictures that a guy wants to have them sign and then resell them. Yes, yes, yes. That reflected in the sun and he was waiting at the right door. Novak was inside doing the press conference and, you know, he was looking like during the press conference and he saw me outside and he went like this. And I was like, okay, is he going to take that door? That door was the door where he had his car. He came out, he was signing to lots of people. And then he was like, hey, Julie, how are you? So two months after he recognized me, that worked. Wow. That's <laughs> awesome. That's really great. Mm. <laughs> and that's since then that he knows very well who I am. Yeah. He looks out every time. Oh, there she is. Okay, cool. I've got some... He needs, well, like, he needs have... some support because he usually doesn't get uh, a lot of support at a lot of these events, or at least mm. the past couple of years. Or is that the narrative of the media? It is. Is it? Yeah. It is. I mean, there are, we can't lie. There are some crowds that are awful to him, but I also believe that they believe what they read in the media. Sure. You know, I actually bumped into a guy the other day in, in Wimbledon. We were waiting at the end of practice, and that guy said to me, oh, yeah, I don't like Novak Djokovic because, you know, he's promoting anti-vax stuff. And I said, excuse me, what? I said, please tell me where you saw Novak saying I am against vaccines and I am urging people not to get vaccinated. Yeah. And he was like, oh, oh, I said, it doesn't exist. Right. So I said, but you see, this is the kind of thing. And I believe some of the media are very well to blame about this. Of course. You know, actually, just before doing this with you, I was already... Um, correcting people on Twitter who again are saying that he tried to enter Australia illegally. It's oh my not God, true. They still haven't let that go. <laughs> it's not true. Like he, it was legal. So right. Can we? St- but you know all all these narratives. And I think for the average tennis people, you know, if they read the um, big media, they're going to believe these things. Like it's literally, true. the BBC at some point said that he forced his way into Australia. That is not true. But imagine the BBC saying that. So someone, you know, who's, you know, an average tennis fan who just reads the news is going to be like, well, if the BBC says it, then it's true. Right. And it's not just them. It's a collection of these other outlets doing it. So that's when you're oh, like, oh, definitely. Yeah. So they're definitely. like, oh my God, everyone's saying it. So it must be true. <laughs> like, it's exactly. A terrible. Approach I don't know if you it. remember like a year ago when, uh, when he was at the Olympics and there was a question about dealing with pressure. Right. And the guy at the beginning of the question, the journalist, said oh you know simon Biles i said about dealing with pressure and he said what about you you are you've won the last the first three slams you're running for the um gold calendar slam you know what how do you deal with pressure and then he said oh for me pressure is a privilege you know but he never ever mentioned simon Biles. he never oh, yes. criticized them i remember that yeah 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 that was and then a one spin. big french journal said oh he's saying to simon Biles, pressure right. is a privilege and then all the people, like it went into a massive scandal. And even the journalist who asked the question did say he never talked about Simon Biles. Yes. It was too late. It was too late. Yes. And and this is where sometimes the media make mistakes that you're just like, how can you? How can you? You know, I, I don't know. Well, that's just... why they're, that's a whole nother topic. That's why they're losing yeah. a lot of trust and, and you know, they're, they're their own downfall, essentially. So, you know. 
Yeah. All those things work out. So, okay, you, you went to a bunch of different games, and I actually don't know if my Zoom's going to run out, so if, if at some point I, I disappear, sure. we'll just restart <laughs> it. Um, so, yeah, you went to a bunch of different games. What's your, like, favorite um, event, match, trophy mm. that you've gone to? Because I'm sure like, you get asked that a lot. Oof. Can I say the next one that I haven't gone to yet? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I mean, I have to say, but maybe it's because I don't have any perspective. But um, this Wimbledon just now felt very special. This Wimbledon, okay. I think uh, Novak and Novak fans needed it, you yeah, know. I was, and yeah. after everything that you know we've gone through, um, yeah, I mean, I've been super lucky. You know, sometimes I'm not always at trophy because I can't go the full weeks, etc. In terms of what are my favorite um, tournaments to go to as a fan, I think Monte Carlo is my top one so far. Can't blame you. Nice it's, scenery. <laughs> yeah, and it's just so easy to meet players, and right. and the tickets are quite affordable as well. To be honest, um, even though you might be right at the top, you know, it's, it's you know. Um, They're all good views. Monte Carlo, I've seen the courts like mm. the views are unbelievable. And you can see the practices of every single player. Right. Whilst there are some tournaments where the practices are hidden and you can't really meet them either or you can't even approach them, which I think is a shame. You know, right. I think as a fan, I tend to rate tournaments um, according to whether or not it's easy to meet the players. Fan um, accessibility or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. US Open and the practice week are pretty good for that as well, to be honest. After that, it's more complicated during the actual tournament especially for the big players. Right. But the practice week is, is you know, it's all free. Like you can come in every day. There's the schedule of where they practice and when, wow. what time. And you don't pay a penny to go in. That's like cool. it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, this Wimbledon was quite special. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think um, if there... If there's an, I mean, last year as well, Wimbledon last year, because Novak was at 19 and won Wimbledon and got to 20. So it right. was 20, 20, 20. Right. Um, quite a special one as well. Um, I was around for Wimbledon 2019, but I was on the hill. Okay. Um, which, which was particular because <laughs> I was surrounded by Roger Federer fans. <laughs> of course. Most of them starting to get really drunk because it had been five hours. Okay, fair. And and uh, I don't drink, so um, my level was not as same as them. But the joy afterwards was just from another world for yes. us. Yes, two fans. match points mm -hmm. down, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was I remember a lot of tears in the crowd that day, probably. <laughs> <laughs> of joy for us. Of joy for you, but yeah. Uh, I remember thinking, because I was with a few other Novak fans, and I was remember thinking, what is the shortest way for me to leave and without being rage, but just to avoid people when Novak was, you know, 40-15. Well, Roger was at 40-15. Right, right. Well, luckily, I didn't have to do that. Um, but, yeah, I do like going. Like, I've seen him um, win the Paris Masters a couple of times now as well, which is quite special, you know. Sure. Um, you know, it is in France, and when it's in France, it's always quite special for me. Um, yeah, I mean, everywhere, when he enters the court, um, it's difficult to be there only for finals, you know. And I haven't seen that many finals because uh, because of work. It's right. every single time it's because of work or because of money. Um, but, yeah, yeah. I've, I've you know, you I've been also quite... Yeah, I've been quite lucky as well to go to Belgrade a couple of times and uh, well, yes. many, many times now. Before you go into that, let me, my Zoom might yeah. die, so let me refresh. Sure. So I think we were talking about you going to Serbia for the Belgrade Open. Yeah. Yeah, I went before that. Um, that was the last time I went. I think the first time I decided to go was February 2019. I had, I had a week off work um, because I'm, you know, as a teacher, I've got set holidays. Right. And I was like, oh, why not go to to Belgrade, you know, like for a first time. And um, there was also another fan that I knew via the internet. I was like, you know, let's try and meet. We didn't manage to meet then. but um, A Serbian I fan still... in Serbia or is it someone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. as in uh, she was, um, I knew her from social media. Oh, and, okay, you know, okay. I, had, I had a good vibe um, about her. Because, you know, sometimes you meet, I've met a lot of people on social media and you have a, a whole wide range of people. Sure. Uh, 98 percent of them extremely good 
Um, there's a 2% nah. Um, but anyway, and I decided to go and uh, she couldn't make it to see me because she um, she was outside of Belgrade for a couple of days because of uni, etc. Anyway, and she said, oh, you have to go to the tennis center and stuff. And uh, I was hoping Novak would be at the tennis center um, when I would go because I knew he was around in Belgrade. So I assumed he was going to go and practice. And actually on that day, the the people welcomed me so well and and they said yeah he's gonna arrive at some point like just wait for him and then Novak was like hey what are you doing here and <laughs> then um yeah it, it was awesome and then after that I went back um a year later actually just before COVID I went back in February 2020 where that's also a funny story so then I met that friend Elena in right. person we met and uh, I love the fortress can I make done? So we went there, we watched the sunset and then we decided to take a cab to go to Novak's restaurant um, together because, you know, that's the, you know, the, the general headquarters, you know? Right. And we get out of the cab and suddenly, so I, she sees Novak, I see Yelena inside the restaurant and we had no idea. Like we literally had no idea because the day before he was in Italy. Right. So, I wasn't sure whether or not he was going to come back to Belgrade, but once again, it was my only time where I could go because usually my other holidays, I go to tennis tournaments or to visit my family in France. And this was amazing because this, I also had just had an operation to my hands. Um, so I had my hand in a scarf or in a, in a okay, cast as well. Yeah. Okay, cast. Exactly. And um, Novak knew I had issues with my thumb, but he didn't know I was going to have the second operation. Of course, he didn't know. So I had, I had just had the second operation and, I mean, I was fine, apart from the fact that I couldn't use my hand. But um, I remember the waiter said to us, he's, he's going to come out now of the of the of that room, you know. So they were actually saying to all people, like, they were very kind. And um, Novak came out, but there was something stuck in the door. And then he saw me and he was like, what did you do? <laughs> he saw me. <laughs> She's like, well, I just had my second operation, but I'm fine. <laughs> And then he wanted to know all about it because um, I had an arthroscopy. So I had, um, you know, I don't want to go into too much details, but basically there was a camera in my ligament. Right. And I, I could watch the inside of my hand. So I was, I was saying that to Novak. Exactly, that was Novak's reaction. <laughs> and me, it was my opposite one. I was just like, oh, I loved it. I was like, it's so cool. Like, who can say they watched right. the inside of their body, you know? Right. And Novak said to me, oh, during my operation for the elbow, I couldn't, you know, watch anything, whatever. And me, I'm the opposite. I'm like, you know, show me. Get more cameras. Why not? <laughs> well, you know, like, who can say that they've seen the inside of the ligaments? Not you know, many not people. a lot. Of, not a exactly. Lot of well, I can. <laughs> And uh, yeah, then he asked me, I remember that question where it's not the first time he asked me, he said, um, are you busy tomorrow? <laughs> and I was like, well, let me check my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, if you want to, you can, you can come and watch my practice. I'd love to have you there. And I was like, yes, please. <laughs> I will be there. Right. So I can't remember what time he told me to go, but, um, and Elena was with me. So I said, can I have a plus one? He said, of course, you can have a plus one, bring me a plus one. And then that's when I started watching his practice. And now it's quite, um, I can't believe I'm about to say that, but it's quite common grounds for me that when I go to Belgrade and he's around, that I go and watch his practices. Right. And it's always such an honor because you don't have many people. And I remember that first time we went with Elena, it was a Sunday. And at some point we were eight people in the bubble, eight wow. people. Like there was Novak, his coach and a physio. And yes. then there was on the other side, the sparring partner, a coach and the physio and me and Elena. Wow. There was no one else. It's like your own private showing. It completely was. <laughs> and we were literally, we had the chairs opposite them, but we were like, the the, the court was just there. You right. know, it's not like, even even when you're first row at Roland Garros or whatever, there's always, you know, a little gap because of yes. cameras, because of material. Here, no, it was, it was amazing. So, yeah. And uh, since then, I've been a couple of times, I mean, I went in December, so I went in February 2020, which was just before, like 2019, February 2020, December 2020, when I brought him um, a little gift. Um, and that's also when I met his um, part of his uh, PR Serbian team, um, because they were there the same day. Right. And then I went in October 2021, which is when I played with him. And yeah, then how, I did went... that, how did that come about? Tell me about that. That was kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can't just brush over that part. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
you know, I, I believe in lots in manifestation. I believe in, in karma. I believe if you do good things, good things come back to you. And and I don't know. I just when I packed my bag, I knew I was going to Belgrade, and I knew it was going to be around. And I was assuming I was going to be able to watch this practice. Um, I was like, let me pack my sports stuff. Like, right. you know, I, I just I just had a vibe. Okay. You had a vibe. <laughs> I had a vibe. I really had a vibe. I went on okay. the Thursday, and on the Thursday when I saw him, he, fin- he had finished his practice, um, and I saw him in the center before even right. being in the in the thing. And um, I remember, um, yeah, he said, "Come to you to the practice the day after." And you're gonna think I'm crazy, and people are gonna think I'm crazy, but I promise you, it's true. I woke up on the Friday morning, Friday the 22nd of October, right, uh, 2021. I woke up. And I said to myself, today's a great day to play tennis with Novak Djokovic. <laughs> I just... Really? So I got my sports stuff. It's not that I crazy. Had... I mean, I believe it. Why wouldn't I believe that? <laughs> because some people don't believe in manifestation and don't believe in destiny and don't sure. believe in those kind of things. I have a much more rational mind. Sure. And in a way, I am a rational person, but I also, you know, believe in that. Yeah. And I, I took my, my... I dressed up with my sports stuff. I had my trainers on. I even had my tennis shoes in my bag, just so you know, you know, <laughs> right. which I didn't, I didn't put them on. I had, I had just trainers and I was such, my hair is down most of the time. I had a thing, a hair, like I was so ready in my head. I had a hairband around my, my wrist to be able to, to, to just put my hair up in case right. I needed to. Wow. And I needed to. That's dedication. That's preparation right there. Yeah. And then at the end, so on that day, there were, uh, Victor Troiki, who was playing as the role of the coach, because Goran, right. I guess, was off. And there was Marco Paniki, his, uh, his um, fitness trainer, Novak. And then there was a sparing partner who was, quite, I believe, if I remember well, a young boy and his coach. Okay. And at some point, Novak said to that young boy, I'm done. But Novak kept on and on. Um, and he, he worked on a few techniques. And... Um, on that day, I remember, usually when Novak does his practice, I'm out, as in I'm opposite him, but I'm not involved in the conversation. On that day, Novak was involved in the conversation. I remember Victor Troiki being like, where are you from again? And Novak was like, oh, she's a mix. I was like, uh, uh, uh. I'm French, buddy. I've got the UK citizenship, but I'm not a mix. Oh, my God. <laughs> but anyway, I, was, I, was, I felt like I was part of the team, to be right. honest. And at the end, we talked about, because that was the day that the Vienna draw was going to come out. And if Daniel Medvedev was um, part of the Vienna draw, that meant Novak could have potentially lost the number one spot and therefore um, finishing the year as number one as a record seventh time was in sort of danger. Right. And then at the end of the practice, Novak was like, Judy, come here. And he said, Judy, can you remind me? Because, you know, he was like, you're a super fan. So he was he was playing with me. He said, yeah. can you remind me how many weeks I've been number one? And after the US Open, I had taken a few weeks off social media. So usually I was doing the count every uh, Monday with a GIF, you know, on Twitter. Right. So I was like, and I remember seeing the tweets of another lady who does stats and stuff, who's a mathematician. And her name is Yolita. And I remember seeing the amount of weeks guaranteed and anyway, I was mixed up in my, and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, like, this is a dare. I said, what, what if I win? And what if you win? Like, what do we do? And he said, what do you want? And I said, if I win, I want to play tennis with you for five minutes. And he said, okay, sure. And as I didn't ask what if, <laughs> actually, he said, what if you lose? I said, if I lose, I also play tennis <laughs> with And he was like, I'm ah, not sure. <laughs> but anyway, and, uh, I remember so well, like I, I gave a number, but I wasn't sure of it. And then we both went to Google. He Googled himself <laughs> to see how many weeks he had. I went onto the Twitter of a girl called Christina, who also does it every Monday. Right. And I, re- I remember saying to her, like, oh, this girl, you know, she does it every Monday. Like, I trust her. And I got the number wrong. And I remember being like, oh, no, like, it's not. <laughs> This, is, this was my only shot. Right. And then the three of us, so Marco, a physio from the center, and Victor Troiki were sort of teasing me. We're like, oh, too bad, Judy. Too bad you're not <laughs> playing with him. And then they said, all done. Let us have a reunion, a meeting, to decide whether or not we can change that. So the three of them, oh Novak God. was sat on his chair. Just playing so with your were, heart. <laughs> they were completely playing. And then they turned around. They were like, no, no. And you're in French, the no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember looking at Novak being like, 
I was like, in my head, I was like, you're not going to do that, like, are I've you? got the tennis shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, look, oh, I brought the shoes. Well, they were on the other side of the court. But then he stood up, picked up another racket in his bag. And I remember he said, come on, girl. And I was like, ah. yeah. uh, I gave my phone to Marco. And then I tied up my hair. I had the headband just here, ready to go. So I remember running to, because I had my coat on, because I was quite cold. And I just, I dropped the 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 coat. You're being like, okay, ready, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. And then I think Novak wasn't, was not really sure of my level. Sure. And I think both him and Marco, when they saw I could send it back across the net, they were like, okay, it's not going to be right. <laughs> too much of hell. <laughs> but then Novak was trying to coach me in French, but I only realized that afterwards when watching the videos because the echo was so big right. that i thought he was making small talk and then <laughs> actually I'm not, i mean i'm a bit ashamed but i'm not ashamed because you know i didn't know that was selling me off <laughs> it was like we're not playing we're not talking when we're playing <laughs> and he said you know what's your racket like you know and then i was like oh yeah nice racket because i had oh no my idea what God, he was saying that's so good but I was that was fun to be honest, and um, I didn't want to make it too long. So at some point, I, I when when um, he was kind because a couple of times I sent the ball away. And he was like, "That's okay," and then he was chanting my name as legs were like, "Allez Julie, allez Julie, allez Julie," <laughs> which was so sweet. Also doing it in French, and I, I asked him to serve at me. I said, "I want you to serve properly at me. Do it." Right. You know, I was like, "I want to, I want to see the speed of a ball when I'm in front of it," and. Um, <laughs> I remember opposite he was like pretending to like shake his bum and trying to make me laugh, you know. And uh, then he did the first serve. I did post that part. Um, he did the first serve and he ended up in the net. And oh, I yes, I remember that. Yes, it was not on purpose. I genuinely think he wanted to be nice with the serve, right. but then it was not strong enough, right. And then the second time he served and I sent it back and it's so funny because clearly Novak could destroy me in one second. And he was doing this sort of noise. He's like, ah, ah, <laughs> when clearly he right. had no struggle sending back the balls that I was sending. So, um, and then I won that point. I mean, yes, uh, he got it out. Uh, he hit it. Exactly. Right. So I, I said, let's stop there. I'm, I'm yeah. sticking to me. So overall, it was Your record is five one minutes. Some of the best, like one of the best records against Novak on the planet. You yeah. <laughs> And then Marco was giving me my phone back and Novak was like, uh-uh-uh, we record this. So then he was about to say something, but because I had won the point when Marco said to me, it's recording, I said, oh, so who's the goat now? <laughs> and then again, after that, um, you know, he said, the goat is on your t-shirt. I was like, good that you admitted that it's you. <laughs> and uh, after that, I was like, thank you so much. You know, I put the racket back. I was like, okay. Right. You know, the be I did take a look at the racket because it was the golden racket they had then, you know, for the 311 weeks plus right, right. of being number one. And uh, Novak said, oh, we have to play the tradition. I said, what? And in my head, I, know what, I knew what the tradition was. And for me, being able to play that game with him, which is the game of the pétanque, you know, that he yes. plays with his team when you're behind the net and you like throw the ball and you have to be close to the um, close to the baseline oh, lot baseline yeah the closest to the baseline is right. the winner for me that game is the you know the top of the top like it's team Djokovic playing that so he said oh we have to play and then I won <laughs> yeah I saw that. <laughs> we tried to cheat but I won but overall he just Novak is I find him very good not only with me but all fans to the moment you talk to him that he's making you feel very special like he listens to you. He's, he's, he's a very good listener, you know, and he's, as I said, he has patient, that capacity. Right? He has a patient yeah. to deal with everyone yeah, yeah. every day. It's like, it's a lot of people. Yeah. And yeah. But he has that capacity at making you feel that, yeah, indeed, you are very special, you know? Right. And on that day, he, he gave me one of the most beautiful gifts, you know, because I know I've met Novak a lot, but in terms of time, like yeah. every single time I see Novak, the time is kind of, of conversation is kind of, limited and rightfully so because you know he has so much sure. to do i mean things that was when i played with him in october 21 where things shifted but then when i saw him in february 2022 after australia in belgrade as well that that was completely different and then i had a lot of time with him which was amazing but that was i think the first proper time where i had i don't know 15 20 minutes overall with him you know and marco and it was just so magical you know, right. and, and once again, I, I repeat it, you know, I'm lucky, I'm privileged, etc. But on that day, it was 
extra, extra, extra special, you know? And for me, playing tennis with him was always, it, it is the thing right. that I think is the best thing ever, you know? Um, and yeah, he, he, well, I was about to say he made it happen, but I'm tempted to say we made it happen because, you <laughs> it know, I destiny. did force, it, was, it was, I think it was. And yeah. um, it was awesome. But I remember my legs, like my legs, I could not see them shaking but I could feel them shaking. Like right. it was, I've never had this before. Like it's the same kind of feeling that I remember having stage fright before doing a show when I was 14 in school, right. like singing. It was the same kind of fear that I had. Um, but yeah, it was, That's it was cool. really awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. And then recently you got a racket from him at Wimbledon. Yeah. How, how did that happen? That's, that's, really cool. Well, it started with a conversation with this, um, so in Monaco this year, at some point, one of his agents, Eduardo, um, came to watch the practice next to me, um, which which is uncommon because usually Eduardo goes on the on the court or doesn't go. And he came with me w amongst the crowd. And at some point, Edo um, said something like, oh, Julie, you must have all of Novak's attire because over the years he must have given you everything, you know. Right, and right. I said, actually, when we talk about it, um, of course, once again, I'm super lucky, but I only have um, two hats and a and a, um, a wristband, you know, like um, in terms of um, attire. And right. he said, "Oh, you don't have you don't have a racket." I said, "That's the one I would love to have, you know, because right. the rackets." And he said, "Why don't you ask him?" I said, "No, no, no, I don't ask. I don't ask." I was like, "No." He said, "I'll ask him for you." And um, I don't know what happened afterwards, but it didn't happen. But um, then um, I remember Edo being like, you need to make Novak aware about this. Like, you need to just tell him. So I did at Wimbledon uh, when I met him at some point. And Novak was like, really? I said, no, I, I don't have one. He was like, at the end of this tournament, you're having one. I'm promising that. I said, okay. <laughs> and then he saw me. So on, um, on uh, Sunday, so yeah, we were about to be kicked out of the grounds because usually we wait by a balcony where... Um, the winner does interviews, but then they told us, oh, he's not going to make interviews. But then Novak hadn't crossed the bridge. So right. the bridge, usually the winner goes on the bridge of Wimbledon because it's good for photos and also because Novak has the habit of giving away clothes that he has signed. And like, right. he's, a, he's above all of us. So we're not, you know, he's, he's throwing the clothes, you know. Right. And uh, it was, I think, 10 to 8. And suddenly Novak finally crossed the bridge after, I don't know, three hours. So we all ran. And... Um, a few of us had had flags so we we um we took out the flags and uh, i took out mine and he saw me and he was like and he was like he was trying to shout at me elena who's his other agent and yeah. um elena was aware about novak's promise and then suddenly i'm waiting i don't know 30 seconds after that and edo again comes back on the balcony or maybe a minute and edo is calling my name but of course there are loads of fans down there and as soon as everybody saw edo with the racket everybody came close to under Edo. Right. So I said to Edo, uh-uh, like, if you do that, it's not me who's having it. Right. Like, even though you say this girl, like, you know. So we made a sign of walking down. So we walked, we walked down 10 meters and nobody followed me, to be honest, because it was not Novak, I don't know, or right. nobody. So then I went and Edo threw it to me because I think they did it on purpose. If it had been Novak, everybody, like, yeah. rightfully so, would have, you know, um, right. gone and I think he only had one to give and, and he, he held his promise. You know, I, I respect him for that. And I, I'm honored. Really, That's I am. So, cool. so, yeah. And then I, I pretended I slept with it, which I did not. <laughs> <laughs> and now, since then, I'm receiving money offers. Of course. And yeah. Think, Were you not expecting that? It, <laughs> that many? No. Yeah, of course. Honestly, it's a, no, a, I was... a winning racket signed by Joko. I know, but... I mean, I'm surprised that people think I would say yes. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what I'm most surprised would, about. You're gonna have to bury me with a with a racket. <laughs> I'm like, guys, it's not going in anyone's hands. <laughs> I just might. Well, I did let a lot of people um, take photos with the racket because you know they ask very nicely. It's not and... transitioning to someone else's hands and staying with them is what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, that's super that's cool. cool. Super super cool. You've reached the pinnacle of a Joko fan. I don't know if. Uh, I don't know what else there is. Uh, Olympics. Olympics. 
gold medal. Well, that's uh, it. That's the last one. For him, yes. yes. I, I had saved so much money to go to Tokyo. I was like, I am going to Tokyo. At the same time, I'll go to Japan, you know, like, I'm going to make a, a three weeks trip when I'm not only being a tourist, sure. but also, you know, going for the Olympic Games and then and then COVID. And then 2021, they had no crowd, so I just couldn't go. And luckily, I got all of the money back because it was a lot of money because I had booked right. everything. Right. Um, but I, it was pretty tough for me to accept that I wouldn't go and wouldn't watch him because London 2012, I literally didn't have the money. Rio de Janeiro 2016 was way too expensive for me, you know, to go across the world sure. um, back then. And then Tokyo, I was like, okay, now it's the time. So Paris 2024. I was going to say, that's, if that's not destiny, I don't know what is. Like, that's perfect. Well, you know, it's it's only, you know, well, less than two years now. Well, two years, two years. Sorry, two years so. Yeah. so let's hope, let's hope. Let's hope. I mean, thank you so much for your time uh, as a no problem. diehard NOLA fan. Uh, these stories are pretty cool. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. To be honest, I, I've always said it, but I, I'm going to write my own book one day because I have so many more stories and I have so many anecdotes of, of like witnessing yeah. Novak's greatness. And we didn't even talk about him. your travels when you go to these places. You know, we didn't even talk about mm. all the other stuff. This could be a three hour podcast. I mean, <laughs> It could be, <laughs> but I definitely want to write a book because I just want to, I just want to write it not on, not for people to read it, but for me as a memory, sure. you know, I want to put it into something and one day, not now, cause it's, it's it takes time and, and, and my adventures are not over. Yes. Cause you course. know, there are a few things, hopefully there's something I can say in public soon that I did. That's quite cool, but I can't say anything right now because Teaser, it's, wow. I'm not the Love boss. It. So I can't say anything, but then I have a few other ideas of a few things that I do want to happen and, and I think they will. So, you know, Beautiful. we'll I, see. I wish you all the best with that. And once again, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for your time. No problem. Thank you for having me.